Greetings, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, and welcome to this first Sunday in Lent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathe into the dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and our acts of kindness and strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in your mercy. We acknowledge that you hate nothing you have made and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, O Lord, that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, 
Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our op and oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring you the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Word of God, word of life. A reading from the New Testament, the book of Romans, chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and is so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter beginning in the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, or into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, 
If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our triune God. Amen. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in or into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. What a mysterious story this is, not least because there were no eyewitnesses, no earthly companions for our Lord to confide in, which makes me wonder, was this a story that Jesus told to his mother, or maybe later to his disciples? How did they receive it? How should we? The story of our Lord in the desert confronting natural privation and contending with supernatural forces as well. One of the takeaways for Martin Luther was to recognize the importance of knowing the scriptures well so that the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil might be beaten back by the word of God. There is certainly great prudence in arming ourselves with the truth of God's word, perhaps no better time than during Lent, our own season of privation, when we get to learn again, to listen to wisdom's voice over against the harmful self-talk to which we are all too often a captive audience. Now there's another more ancient way of reading this story as an allegory rehearsing really the whole of salvation history. In other words, whatever our Lord underwent in that Judean wilderness, it was for us and for our salvation. This is what St. Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians when he writes, Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It is through our Lord's physical and spiritual vulnerability, his privations in the desert, that we are made whole, that we are fed. And maybe that's why each of the Synoptic Gospels offers us this rare glimpse of our Lord's interior life to remind us that there is no mental health crisis, no experience of hunger or scarcity, no temptation, no spiritual struggle that our Lord has not faced on our behalf. No desert that we enter that he is not already present. Present with us in the desert by the Holy Spirit. And though it's often overlooked in our overly rationalist context, dreams and visions were a religious staple of Jewish and early Christian life. So Luke in the book of Acts can describe Peter falling into a trance while hungering and meditating atop the rooftop in Joppa. And Paul can write coyly of his own cosmic vision. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, Paul says. Like Paul, 
Perhaps we can leave unresolved the question of whether our Lord's encounter with the devil was a thing undergone in body or in spirit. But isn't it interesting how similar this account to the various vision quests we find in indigenous cultures? Think of rites of passage, transitions to adulthood through acquired survival skills and mystical experiences to help a young person discover their role in the tribe, take walkabout, lasting as long as six months, serving just this practical and spiritual function in Australian Aboriginal cultures. We miss this story archetype, though, because we secular postmoderns, in our great wisdom, have given up on a shared story. We have expunged such rites of passage from our culture to the detriment, no doubt, of our social cohesion and to the confusion of our young adults. The closest we come in our time is handing car keys to a 16-year-old. Now, of course, our Jewish kindred have bar and bat mitzvahs, and the church has baptism and confirmation, but even these rites, sadly, have become largely perfunctory. Yet acknowledging this archetype of the vision quest and the desert trial can be a first step toward recovering that ancient way of seeing the world, where the material and the spiritual are inexplicably intertwined. And here I think we can dig even a little deeper. With all due respect to our bishop, Shelley Brian Wee, who preached on this text three years ago at my installation here, The Greek preposition translated in, in the NRSV, doesn't just denote accompaniment, but direction or directedness. It's not enough to say that Jesus is led by the Spirit, true as that statement is. Our tradition and our context make clear that it is the Spirit who leads Jesus into the desert. Now, granted, the Greek verb used in Matthew and Mark's Gospels have a softer resonance. To be led is not to be coerced. Still, our earliest account of this event in Mark preserves the sense that Christ is being propelled into the desert by the very same spirit that filled him in his baptism. The verb Mark uses means to eject or cast off. It's the same verb used when Jesus drives out demons, expels money changers, or speaks of plucking out offending eyes. In other words, fresh from his baptism, Jesus is thrown into the wilderness by the Spirit. And of course, there is deep allegorical significance here. It's as if our Lord is symbolically reversing Israel's own journey crossing back over the Jordan River, back out into the desert, the place of trial and testing, where Israel wandered for 40 years. Now Jesus, to fulfill all righteousness, recapitulates Israel's whole history, down to the fact that on the far side of his desert ordeal, he will symbolically reconstitute the 12 tribes when he gathers his 12 disciples. What this means for the early church as much as for us today is that this desert trial isn't just a strange anecdote in our Lord's biography, but it's the very conditions of his preparation for a public ministry characterized by reversals, where the blind will see and the lame will walk and the sinners be forgiven. As I look back on Bishop's message to me and to all of us three long years ago, I affirm that the Spirit does indeed lead us in the desert. God goes with us through every trial. But the great mystics and the spiritual writers in our Christian tradition all affirm that it's more than that. That little preposition into means that the desert is where our Heavenly Father has led His Son by the Holy Spirit as surely as the cross is where the Father will call the Son by the Spirit. And there should be some comfort in that truth. Maybe you've heard that expression, he who led you to it will also lead you through it. 
through the dryness and the privation, in the wandering and the wondering, and in spiritual combat with the father of lies, our Lord is demonstrating his mastery over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Victory over every dark thought, every temptation to self-harm, every temptation to power and prestige. And yes, it's true. Our own experiences with the wilderness, they are never as triumphant. But it is the very same Spirit who leads us into our deserts, who incites us to embark on our own vision quests. Remember your Old Testament. It was God who led the people of Israel out of slavery by his mighty hand. Yet that didn't stop them from grumbling to Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread or water, and we detest this worthless food. How like our complaints in prayer are the Israelites' complaints to Moses when we find ourselves in our desert places. Yet underneath the frustration, there is faith. Why have you presumes that God is leading us? It was you, O Lord, who brought me here. It was you, O Lord, who brought us together for this season. See, heartfelt prayer begins with honest confession of fear and doubt and disappointment, but it is most often the desert places that drive us to our knees. We want to stay on the Mount of Transfiguration. Of course we do. But the Spirit leads us down the penitential slope, down into these 40 days of Lent. So we ought not be afraid to affirm that the Spirit leads us into times of trial. God does not tempt us to sin, but the spiritual life is filled with tribulations which God allows for the good of our souls and for the furthering of his kingdom. And faith means learning to trust in God's providence, even as we offer up our daily petition to be spared the time of trial, the time of temptation. It's the very prayer our Lord will pray in a desert of a different kind, one lush and verdant as this wilderness is dry and desolate. In fact, it's another garden that gives us an interpretive key to today's lesson, a key to unlocking this story, this parable, this vision. Because even more fundamental than a lesson about our existential sojourns in the desert, what Luke's gospel offers here is humanity's story. A story of temptation and fall from grace. St. Paul writes that the first Adam is a type of Christ, making this connection explicit. And we hear that word Adam and we know that story so well, how upon encountering the tempter's lies in the form of that serpent, Adam succumbed to temptation, thus beginning this pattern that will play itself out generation after generations, becoming constitutive of what it means to be a human being living east of Eden. But now, now it is the new Adam who is cast out of the garden of baptism, driven from the water into the wilderness, where he overcomes the tempter's snares by perfect obedience to the Father's will. There are, of course, no victories, or rather no witnesses to this victory in the desert. But on that cross, what is hidden here will be made manifest. And with the eyes of faith, those first followers will look upon the shame of the cross and see in it not death, but new life. The archetype of the tree that cursed humanity now become the tree of life. And the life-giving fruit hanging from its branches, nothing less than the first fruits of a new creation, a new humanity in our sinless Savior who recapitulates in his very person not only the story of Israel, but the story of the whole of humanity. The first man, Adam, became a living being, St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. 
but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. As my friend Pastor Stout has explained it, God makes a new Adam, introducing a new harmony to disrupt, a new balance to overthrow, and this tempts the tempter. So that in the wilderness ordeal, what the devil attempts is turning our Lord's humanity against his divinity. That strikes me as dead right. Because Satan is always seeking to turn humanity against divinity. After all, isn't that what the crucifixion is all about? The creation turning on the creator. Executing the one who is fully God and fully man. Thus, in that moment, humanity not only turns against her God, but turns against her own humanity. Yet God turns all of that on its head, remaking the dead ends of deprivation and suffering in the cross to be the very doorway to salvation. Bethlehem, as these 40 days stretch before you, take the time to listen to the Holy Spirit to be attentive to the wisdom of the word. For this Lent is your pilgrimage, your vision quest. And yes, this is a penitential season, so resist temptation. But when you fall, repent. And above all, rejoice when you face trials of every kind, knowing that Christ has gone ahead of you to accomplish what you could not. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and the redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. bless you and keep you, make his face to shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.